Um, just want to say good good afternoon and welcome to uh, this afternoon's webinar on financial viability assessments. We've got a good turnout of people here, so um, we'll get cracking and then hopefully people, if they're a bit later, they can they can join as they come along. Just by way of introduction, I'm David Halston. I'm a director here at Altair um, and I look after all our sort of development viability work. So be that project work or vi financial viability assessments um, as the topic that we're talking today. Um, and I'm joined here today by Bradley. If you could just quickly introduce yourself, Bradley. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Bradley Solomon, Senior Consultant here at Altair. Um, like David, I work in our development viability team here providing financial viability advice. Um, particularly in relation to financial viability assessments of implant patients. Thank you. Um, if you just move on the slides, Pete Bradley. Um, so today we're covering financial viability assessments. Um, you can see here the agenda uh, for today. Um, we're going to start off the session by just giving a bit of an overview of what an FEA is and how they how they're used in the planning process, and then we'll dive into a bit more detail around the methodology some of the key terminologies that are used, and importantly, the key assumptions that are used to underpin those assessments. Um, and then we'll be looking a bit about the current market context and what the future might hold for sort of financial viability assessments and those key considerations within the process. Um, we've got about an hour. Um, hopefully there's be some time at the end for some questions. Um, and just uh, as a as a flag, we will be we are recording this session and we'll be circulating the recording along with the slides straight after the, um, the session. Next slide, please, Bradley. Um, just really quickly about Altair and the uh, viability team. So Bradley and I sit within the Altair's um, development and regeneration team, um, and we specialize in everything around viability. So like I said before, anything that's to do with financial viability assessments, options appraisals, development appraisals, um, and financial modeling, um, we, we, we sort of lead on that on, uh, within Altair, um, along with other sort of bespoke uh, bits of work like market analysis and research. That's just to give you a flavour of, of what we do within the team. In terms of our FEA experience, so we've listed there the uh, a number of local authority areas where we um, have recently delivered FEA assessments. Um, and I think we had a little count back over uh, the other day and we've delivered over 75 Sort of applications over over the last three years so a real breadth in terms of um, experience and also sort of geographies as well across uh, across the country uh, at that stage i think i'm going to hand over now to bradley to sort of take you through take you through the uh, the webinar yeah perfect cheers david um so yeah like david set out in the agenda um i'm going to start today um by talking through the purpose and the concept of fbas plus a bit of policy context um, that FEA sit within. Um, so I guess first things first, what is an FEA? So yeah, obviously it stands for Financial Viability Assessment. Um, RICs who provide guidance in relation to FEA methodology and interpreting their results define an FEA as an objective financial viability test of the ability of a development project to meet its cost, including the cost of its planning obligations while ensuring an appropriate site value for the landowner and a risk adjust risk adjusted return to the developer and delivery in that project so effectively it can be summarized as highlighted as a test of the, the ability of a development project to meet its costs including the cost of its planning obligations so when and why were they brought into the planning system so they were introduced originally in 2012 as a material consideration um, and this was via paragraph 173 of the MPPF. Um, prior to then, it was the responsibility of developers to negotiate the correct land price with landowners to ensure that a development could be delivered within all of its planning obligations. However, following the 2008 economic downturn, development declined. So government reformed the planning process with the introduction of FEAs to enable developers to negotiate a reduced affordable housing contribution to increase viability and in turn speed up delivery. So whilst viability was brought in as a planning consideration, it's worth noting that it is just one consideration of many as set out here. Um, these considerations are not mutually exclusive um, and combined they influence the overall outcome. They need to be considered together leading to an iterative approach to the assessment of planning applications. 
So where does viability sit more broadly within policy? Um, so starting with the MPPF again, paragraph 34 sets out that plans should set out contributions expected from the development. Um, this should include setting out the levels and types of affordable housing provision required. These contributions prior to the adoption of a local plan are tested at a whole plan level to ensure planning obligations will be financially viable and deliverable. However, the MPPF acknowledges that at a site level, or there may be specific circumstances that mean obligations may not be deliverable on viability grounds. Um, paragraph 58 of the MPPF provides the ability for applicants to utilise FBAs as part of planning applications to justify a reduction in affordable housing obligations. Um, to help professionals in the provision of and review of FBAs, there is national planning policy guidance specifically relating to viability, um, and that sets out the approach and inputs used in the process of FBAs. However, guidance isn't just at a national level. Um, guidance can also be found from RICS, um, but moreover, it can be found at both a regional and local level, and that's shown here on this slide. Um, these documents all look to standardise the approach to FBAs and set out the evidence base expected for the assumptions made within these assessments. Using this guidance, an FBA is generally submitted as part of a broader planning application for consideration by the local planning authority. Applications should, should seek to engage with the local, local planning authority as early as possible if they are concerned that the scheme will not be able to deliver the required level of rural housing set out within the local plan. The FPA is then reviewed once submitted as part of the application by an independent consultant to assess whether the approach taken is in line with policy and the assumptions used are reflective of market conditions. Um, that report is paid for um, by the applicant and not the local authority. A process of negotiation then takes place between the local planning authority and the applicant. Um, this will take place prior to agreement, um, and then there will be agreement on the final level of contribution. This can then, from time to time, where material requested be presented as part of the planning committee meeting. Assuming grant of permission at committee, the agreed level of affordable housing is then secured via a section 106 agreement. So as set out just there, guidance both nationally and locally sets out the method to be adopted within FBAs, but what is that methodology? Um, so the methodology at a high level is shown here in this image. Um, what it looks to do is it looks to compare the income that will be achievable from the proposed development, i.e. the planning application, against what it would cost to deliver that development. When the costs are deducted from that income, the residual land value is then derived and that's what's shown there on that image. Um, the residual land value is effectively the amount of money a developer could pay to purchase a parcel of land. The residual land value is then compared to a benchmark land value. That benchmark land value is simply the assumed value of the site the landowner would seek to achieve based upon the, its current use or in another planning compliant use. In simple terms, the residual land value must meet or exceed the expectations of a landowner, i.e. benchmark land value. Otherwise, the developer will not be able to purchase land and would therefore not be able to deliver the project. So we can work through an example of how to calculate the residual land value, and we can do that in a bit more detail here. Um, so as set out previously, the first thing to do is to calculate what income could be achieved from the proposed development. This is called the gross development value. And you can see here that's £10 million in, that, in this example. Um, it's made up of income that would be received from any private sales, disposals of affordable housing, or any other commercial income. Then the cost of development are calculated. And as you can see here, um, this is typically made up of um, things such as how much does it cost to build, what are the fees that would be incurred in delivering the plan application and selling the homes, um, the cost of any other plan obligations such as seal, um, the cost of interest, plus an acceptable profit margin. And we'll come back to this in a bit more detail later on. These costs are then deducted from the gross development value to reside, to arrive at the residual land value. In this scenario, the total GDP is 10 million pounds, the total costs are 8 million pounds, and therefore the land value remaining is 2 million pounds. In a scenario where the costs decrease to 6.7 million pounds and the GDP stays the same, 
the residual land value will therefore increase. And because the cost is £6.7 million, the residual land value is the difference between that and the gross development value, and therefore the residual land value is £3.3 .3 million. So as set out previously, however, the residual land value won't be considered in isolation. It will only be considered viable if it exceeds the benchmark land value of the site. The benchmark land value is typically one of two things. Firstly, it can be the value of the site in its existing use plus a premium. This is, in effect, the market value of the site in its current use. For example, if the development site in its current use was a car park, it would be the value someone would pay for that car park. A premium is then added to this. This is typically between 10 or 30 percent. This is added onto the existing value of the land to incentivize the landowner to sell the site. This is added to reflect the fact that if the landowner was only offered what it was worth in its current condition, they would have no incentive to sell. They would only sell if a premium was paid on top. The other way a benchmark land value can be calculated is through calculating the site's alternative use value. This is the value the site would be worth if another type of use was implemented on the site. For an AUV to be used, the site must be deliverable or the use must be deliverable. So as an example, on a small site with one small shop on it and no high rise buildings around it, the alternative use value could not be a 15 storey block of flats. It must be a deliverable alternative use in planning terms. Typically, this is evidence through an extant planning consent that is yet to be implemented. But why can't the actual price paid by the developer for a site or for the parcel land be considered as the benchmark land value? The MPPG for viability is clear that the price paid for land is not a reasonable benchmark land value. And this is simply because developers may overpay, they may underpay for land. Land is often brought forward on the basis of hope value, that the, land, um, the land's worth may increase over time with development. However, this can be speculative. This principle was crystallised in the case between Parkhurst Road Limited and the Secretary of State in 2018. Um, so once you have calculated the residual land value and the benchmark land value has been established, they're then compared to one another. If the residual land value, i.e. the value of the land based upon the current proposal, exceeds the benchmark land value, which is the value of the current landowner would reasonably sell the land for, then the scheme is viable. If there is a deficit, the development is considered unviable and the FEA would seek to model reduced affordable housing contributions until a surplus is achieved. So again, we can demonstrate this through a worked example. So firstly, in this scenario, the cost of the development is £7 million. Then we have a combined value of £9 million on a 30% affordable housing scheme. So in this case, 70% of the homes are sold as private sale, and that has a gross development value of 7 million. 30% of the homes are sold to an RP as affordable housing, um, and that has a gross development value of 2 million, so combined 9 million pounds. This leaves a residual land value, i.e. the difference between the two, of 2 million pounds. However, the benchmark land value in this scheme is 2.5 million pounds, as shown by the red line. Therefore, as the residual land value is half a million pounds less than the benchmark land value, this shows that a 30% affordable housing scenario is not viable. What we then look to do is we look to then test what the viability of a 100% private sales scheme is, i.e. the most profitable scenario. So here you can see that if the cost remains static at 7 million pounds, but the gross development value increases to 10 million pounds now because the scheme is 100% private sale, what you can see is the, the residual land value, i.e. again, the difference between the two numbers is now three million pounds. This exceeds the benchmark land value by half a million pounds. Um, so we now know that the 100% private sales scheme is viable and therefore the viable level of affordable housing is somewhere between 0% and 30%. What we then look to do is test out various affordable housing scenarios until we find that perfect equilibrium um, to find the viable level of affordable housing. So what we've done there is established a me methodology, um, but with that methodology, there are a series of assumptions that need to be applied 
um, to establish what the residual land value of the site would be. So what we're going to do now is just run through some of those assumptions and their typical ranges in a little bit more detail. So as you can see, there are quite a long list of assumptions that need to be made. Um, for income, we have, where appropriate, assumptions such as residential sales values and the income that's associated with that, affordable housing income, capitalised commercial rents or capitalised private rents. Um, the costs, typical assumptions include things like developers' return or profit, professional fees, contingency fees, bill costs and abnormal costs, finance costs, and seal slash section 106 fees. You can see there are a range of assumptions highlighted in Peach there, and they're the ones that generally lack an established or agreed um, benchmark rates. Um, so they are more variable on a scheme by scheme basis. All of these assumptions are impacted by a range of by a range of factors, however, including local context, economic conditions, scheme design, and other requirements. So just delving into some of those assumptions in a little bit more detail. Um, the first assumption we're looking at here is um, open market values or the open market sales income. Um, as prescribed by guidance, um, this should typically be derived by considering comparable properties that have recently sold close to the, the subject site. Um, this research is typically carried out using land registry, estate agents, or other prop tech, prop tech tool data. Um, Whilst asking prices can also form a useful indicator of value, they don't represent market evidence. Um, then that's because those um, those values, they're not transacted values. Um, the price could change. It could be negotiated down and reduced. Um, so for each FBA, it's critical that due to local market and context, bespoke research is undertaken to understand the likely achievable values. So where research is compiled, what you generally look for it to consider is things such as location, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, floor slash plot area, um, access to amenity and transport links, um, how recently the property is sold, um, and generally just design and specification. Where there's limited evidence of new build sales, um, a premium on secondhand property should be considered to reflect the typical uplift in value that a new build property typically achieves. Um, generally, this can be between 5 and 10%, depending on location. When undertaking these reviews of other FEAs on behalf of local planning authorities, we ensure that we keep an eye out for things um, like evidence being used that's not comparable with the subject development or where an enhanced specification has been assumed within the bill cost, we ensure that that's reflected in the pricing of the open market sales value units. Um, another assumption to consider in terms of income is how much um, an RP may pay for the purchase of affordable housing units as part of a development. Um, historically, this has been calculated by benchmarking affordable housing income within FBAs um, by using a broad range of um, open market value percentages of open market value, as shown there on the slide. However, guidance has, has evolved slightly over time, um, and FBA should now look to evidence um, that they've undertaken a discounted cash flow analysis. Um, that's the approach typically undertaken by RPs when calculating how much they could have they could afford to pay for affordable housing units. This approach utilizes long-term operating assumptions. Um, so within our reports, we use um, benchmark data sets that we've collected from RPs over time um, to derive what a typical RP package price may be for the affordable housing units. Just moving on to cost, um, the largest cost of development um, within an FBA is that build cost. Um, so within FBAs, there are two ways in which build costs can be considered. The first way is through utilising BCIS data, um, and that will then be adjusted for location, any external works, and any abnormal costs that are required as part of the development. Alternatively, and generally um, what's expected now, is that a FBA will include an order of cost estimate prepared specifically for that site um, and by an independent quantity surveyor. When reviewing it on behalf of an local planning authority, we work with an independent 
QS firm to review these costs. They'll benchmark the costs against other local tenders, um, plus other market data to see if the costs are reasonable and reflective of market conditions. Uh, again, things to look out for in relation to build costs when reviewing FVAs include double counting of both developer contingencies and build contingencies, um, plus inflation. Generally, um, FVAs are done on the basis of current day costs and current day values, so no inflation should be built into the build cost estimates. Um, whilst for build costs, costs tend to sig uh, vary significantly at a scheme level. Um, the fees used within FBAs tend to fall into um, standard ranges or brackets across most applications. Um, typically, fees range as follows. So generally for professional fees, um, they range between around 8 to 12% of bill costs. Sales and marketing costs range between 1.5% and 3% of private sale GDV generally. Um, finance costs generally range between 5 and 7.5%. Although it's worth noting that where there has been um, increases in Bank of England base rate recently, there have been um, more variation in finance costs accepted as part of applications. Um, and then contingency fees, they generally range between 3 and 5% of build. At a local level, benchmarks can be found within um, each local authority's local plan viability assessment for the area. Um, where there's variance from those assumptions, the applicant should provide detailed justification on why at a site-specific level there should be such a variance. When reviewing an FBA, we'll look out for other things such as extended development programs, um, where programs are extended and they're not reflective of that specific development um, and the local market context. Um, the effect of that is that finance costs are pushed up. So in those circumstances, we'd look to revert those back to a reasonable level uh, unless the applicant had a, a, a good justification for why it was extended. The final key assumption um, to consider within an FBA is the developer's profit or developer's return. Um, guidance typically um, sets out that there is a range of generally 15 to 20% on gross development value for private sale units for profit. Um, commercial profit is generally around 15%, whilst for affordable housing, that profit is generally around about 6%. This return should be adjusted on a scheme by scheme basis, reflecting the risk profile of a scheme. Where risk is lower, return should be reduced. Um, an example of this would be economic conditions. Um, so where economic conditions are unstable, an increased profit threshold can be expected. But the reverse is also true. So where economic conditions are stable or favourable um, for development, a, a reduced profit level should be expected from any development. The developer's return is often tested appeal at appeal. Um, this was true recently with Barclay Homes um, testing developer's return. Um, the inspector wrote as part of that appeal case that the target profit allowance used by Barclay of 20% of gross development value was appropriate for the scheme. Um, and this was given the, the uncertain nature of economic conditions at the time for the construction sector. At a simple level, the core reason that a profit margin slash a return is built into the FBA process is to incentivize development. The return is compensation for a developer taking the risk of development. Um, if there was no profit built into the, the methodology, a developer would have no incentive to develop and therefore national house building targets wouldn't be met. So how are these assumptions affected given the current market? Um, I guess over the past couple of years, we've had a, a fairly unstable market. Um, development has been challenging. Um, since the start of January 2022, um, Bank of England base rate has gone up by um, 5%. Um, build costs have gone up 13% over the period, whilst um, on the other side of the coin, sales values have only risen 6.5% nationally. This combination of costs rising at a quicker rate than sales values has meant that across England, FBAs have been used um, and affordable housing obligations have been reduced. However, the economic picture is just a moment in time. Um, so in the future, economic conditions may improve and, and therefore so may development viability. 
Um, so to capture this, local planning authorities have used review mechanisms. These look to early and late stages of the development process, capture improvements in viability. Where profits exceed the level of agreed um, profit at application stage, then mechanisms kick in um, and affordable housing contributions become due at a late stage. Generally, once in policy, our experience is applicants very rarely tend to resist um, review mechanisms. And then finally, looking forwards, um, we expect to see a move towards a few different things. Um, so one trend we're expecting to see is an increased evidence threshold for assumptions within um, financial viability assessments. Last year, as an example, the Mayor of London consulted on a new development viability um, supplementary planning guidance document. Um, and within there, it increases the threshold for evidence across many assumptions. Um, in addition, with house prices now increasing and cost stabilising, um, we expect to see more affordable housing contributions to be captured um, across the country. Similarly, where new planning policy is implemented, we expect to see the increased use of review mechanisms as part of um, applications. And then finally, I guess, um, looking towards reform of the MPPF, um, there was an announcement last month that there may be changes um, to some of the key assumptions used within FPAs. It was mooted within the reform announcement um, that um, on Greenbelt sites, benchmark land values may become a fixed item and non-negotiable. Um, and that's something we'll continue to keep an eye on over the next coming months. Um, so, yeah, that's it from me. Um, hopefully the session was useful. Um, we've now got some time for some questions. Um, but if you don't have any, feel free, us, free, feel free to email us or call David and I afterwards and we'll be happy to discuss any of what we presented today. Thanks. Uh, would, what would be the impact of fixing benchmark land values in the green belt? Yeah, so effectively at the moment where, where benchmark land values are, are variable on a site-by-site -site basis, um, if you were to fix a benchmark land value nationally or regionally, there's still some discussion as to whether or what level they will be fixed. Um, you'll get um, more security over affordable housing contributions. Um, so that's something that we're expecting to see some more clarity on once the MPPF um, comes forward um, in the next couple of months. No. Oh, yep. Yeah. Sorry, there's another one. How is the EUV premium calculated? uh 10 to 30 percent question mark that's from luke yeah so um yeah like you said luke the the, the range is between 10 and 30 percent um, and it's generally around the, the condition of the the existing use um so if you've got a, a high value existing unit that a landowner reasonably wouldn't want to to get rid of because it, it's a strong performing asset then the premium would be towards the top end of the spectrum um, whereas if you've got an asset that's that's poorly performing in its existing use currently, then then that premium would would be reduced. Yeah, so it's still a subjective premium, isn't it, Bradley? That is 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 open to negotiation. But exactly. Like Bradley said, it's it's um, based on the on the condition of the of the um the land at the, at the time. Uh, oh, uh, another one. We use Poplan to um, evaluate um development are there any other models that you would recommend um uh, well, so god david no. i would say pop like, pop lands are tall so we would yeah we we wouldn't be uh suggesting any others um i think typically within the fea process there there are there is is argos i'm allowed to say that word aren't i bradley argos it's usually that tends to be the developers sort of recognized approach to assessing schemes um you can do all the same functionality in, in pod plan but when you when you read and read and see other feas and the feas that we have because we use argos as well that tends to be the um the recognized uh software to use um but it doesn't do discounted cash flow so you can't sort of model uh affordable housing um, income and uh offers it within there uh question from jonathan buckingham the 20 percent return on gdv seems high is this the current target of national builders yeah so within um the the planning policy guidance nationally it, it specifically sets out a range of 15 to 20 percent um on on gdv for private sale profit um and like that case 
um, that I mentioned in the slide, the FNM case showed um, it has been accepted at appeal quite recently um, that 20% is, is a reasonable allowance given economic conditions. Um, but as um, market conditions stabilise, um, like we're seeing at the moment, we're expecting that margin to come down um, across the board on FBAs. Um, one from Ben Cook. Have we had much pushback on the values being paid by HAs within the process? Yeah, I guess our experience is, is generally um, there is that, that, that kind of range, that typical range that we showed on the slides. Um, if it is within that range, um, generally there's there's not a significant amount of, of pushback. It is, it's not one of the bigger the bigger numbers within the application um, and within the reviews. Um, so a lot of the time the 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 argument ends up around profit, sales values, and bill costs as well as benchmark land value. Um, but yeah, from time to time, um, there can be discussions around what is an appropriate affordable housing contribution. Okay, uh, and the last one we've got here is what types of development are most appropriate for late stage review and at what stage in the build? Um, so any FBA, so typical private sale um, led development, um, a late stage and early stage review can be can be used. Um, and and it's particularly in London, it is extremely common um, to be used as, as part of an application. In terms of the stages um, that are used, Generally, um, you have an early and late stage um, review mechanism. Um, so the late stage review, I think, is it's about 50% occupancy or something like that. Um, and the early stage review is partway through through the build process. Um, and again, if that profit margin um, at that review time increases above the threshold agreed at application stage, um, then a payment um, of affordable housing is due at that stage. Okay. I think I, I, I almost said this before. I think that's the last question that we've had that we've got. Um, just give it another 10 seconds just to make sure. But as Bradley mentioned, just while we're thinking, waiting to see if there's any more, more than happy to pick up any, any questions offline after the, the webinar. Um, feel free to give us a, a call or an email directly to either of us and both of us. Um, and again, we'll be sharing the slides and the recording probably later on today or first thing tomorrow. I think I can wrap, oh, okay, great. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Um, yeah, great. Thank you again for, for attending. It's, we've had a really good turnout and hopefully this will be the first of a, a range of um, sort of related topic webinars that we can, we can offer um, in the months coming, but great. Thanks again. Thanks for your time, guys.